All right. Um, so I'm very excited to have Dr. King here with us today. Um, she is somebody that I, whose work I have followed for quite some time, particularly because of the uh, impact it has in, in my space of anthrozoology and kind of studying human animal interactions. Um, she is an emerita professor at William and Mary, as well as a science writer, a freelance writer, and a uh, well-published, I would say, seven books uh, author on topics related to our relationships with other species. She is a biological anthropologist by training. Um, and with that, I think we'll just, we'll get started because I think that, um, you know, we're all here to hear Dr. King speak and not me. Um, I will say really quickly, I am going to have the chat open. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will have an open Q&A afterwards where I will moderate and bring in your questions. Um, but for the interest of time and um, kind of the, the flow of the talk, we'll hold questions until the end. So if they do come up, please drop them in the chat and we will address them in turn once Dr. King is done presenting. So with that, um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. I'm very pleased to be here and I thank you for this invitation. I thought I would start by situating myself uh, geographically. I am speaking to you from a small town in Gloucester County, which is in southeastern Virginia. So I'm near Williamsburg and Yorktown and about three and a half hours south of Washington, DC. And I'm at home, of course, and it's about dusk now. And there are six rescued cats here with me, some of whom may walk across the screen or may not. They make spontaneous appearance sometimes when I'm speaking. So we'll see how that goes. I am going to talk to you for maybe 45 or 50 minutes, and then we will have a question and answer session. And I'm very interested in that session. I don't think of it at all as an afterthought, but rather as very central to what we're doing here. So I really would appreciate it if you would write down any questions or comments as we go, and we can talk about them later. One note about technology. My laptop had some sort of spontaneous fit and would not allow me to control the PowerPoint from here. So Dr. Walsh is kindly doing it. So you'll have to forgive me for saying a whole lot of nexts or next pleases, but I think this will work fine. So on the start slide, you can see that I'm at William and Mary and that I'm active on Twitter, BJ King Ape on Twitter. If you're a Twitter user, come over and say hi. So what I'd like to begin talking about is my most recent project, and then I'm gonna go back in time a little bit to an earlier project and then loop it back to the present. I have been very interested in thinking about how collectively we can increase compassionate action for animals. And I'm thinking about that in broad scope in five different contexts. Next, please. The first context is animals in our homes, and I couldn't resist including pictures of two of those six rescued cats. But as we'll find out in a few minutes, I'm not only talking about domestic companions like cats and dogs, but sometimes the small animals in our homes that we don't always even know are there. Next, please. Animals in the wild is a very important category in this thinking, and we'll talk quite a bit about that tonight. I have been used to thinking traditionally of wildlife as kind of out there in protected areas in national parks or state parks, local parks or reserves. I did my dissertation work in anthropology at Amboseli National Park in Kenya, asking about the learning patterns of baboons. Next, I also visit fairly frequently Yellowstone National Park, which of course is partly in the state of Idaho. And for those of you who are tuning in from Idaho, I should note um, in admiration that you live in a beautiful state. I enjoy my time in Idaho. I have been both in Yellowstone National Park and also enjoyed going through the town of Driggs, if any of you know that as well. Next. But one thing that has become important in thinking about wildlife that will factor into what we talk about this evening is that, of course, we don't have to go to designated specific areas to enjoy wildlife or to think about wildlife or to think with wildlife. In my own yard, I'm very fortunate to live with native turtles. These are box turtles, and we have about five or six resident in our yard. Next. We also have a variety of mammals, groundhogs, squirrels, rabbits, and possums, and on and on. 
in terms of birds. Next, we have a huge variety of songbirds. And you see here on the left, red-headed woodpecker, and on the right, a sharp-shinned hawk. And my love of observing birds zoomed up um, enormously during the pandemic. And this actually is an important point that I'll come back to later in talking about compassionate conservation. Next. And we mustn't forget snakes. We have quite um, a number of black snakes and black rat snakes. And of course, many invertebrates, including insects and spiders. So the wild is a large varied category, both in terms of the animals we're speaking about and the places we're speaking about. The wild is all around us. And sometimes as we'll talk about, the wild comes into our homes. Next. The last three contexts are all involving captivity. And of course, we could consider animals in the home as a type of captivity. But what I'm talking about here is specifically zoos, scientific research laboratories, and also animals considered to be food. So here the context would be on our plates, whether at home or in restaurants or in slaughterhouses. And tonight or this afternoon, next, I'm going to talk about four of those contexts. I'm going to drop out a discussion of zoos and focus on the other four. But again, I want to note that if anyone has a particular interest in discussing zoos, we can go to that in the Q&A. So the focus will be touching on a number of contexts, the home, wild, laboratories, and food animals. And along the way, again, the challenge that I have sort of made collectively and including myself is to think about the contexts of harm that occur and how we can turn them into opportunities for helping animals. Along the way, I'll be mentioning concepts such as compassionate conservation and just one health. Next. So I have really been taken with this idea that I have read through other anthropologists, environmental anthropologists, and other theorists of not just seeing harms that happen to animals as harms alone. And the idea is that if we can allow ourselves to see the whole range of animal-human relating in all of these contexts, this can be a way for us to join together our scholarship, and if we wish, our activism. So that the first step and the reason why we do this at observing harms is to understand that they are a key to making a difference for other animals. And in order to start talking and going through the four contexts, I really want to introduce some other concepts that have been important for me. And in order to do that, I'm gonna set the stage by talking about some work that I've done before and in thinking about what I call the three A's, the three roles that I play when I do this work. So anthropologist, activist, and author. I'm speaking to you there for, from a kind of anthropological narrative tradition in which I don't consider myself external to the work, where I don't consider myself trying to be objective and apart from the work, but rather I am in it and therefore talking about my own experiences is part of the work. Next. So as you heard, I was trained as a biological anthropologist and I'm sure almost everyone in the audience is well aware of what's called the four field approach in American anthropology. So I was trained to take advantage of learning about biological and cultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology and archeology. span And of course we can add to that environmental anthropology and applied anthropology. The specific sub genre that has really called to me in my work is thinking about anthropology beyond the human. You know, if you ask like sort of a person on the street who doesn't study anthropology, could you define anthropology? You very often get a reply back that it's the study of humankind in the past and the present. But of course it's much more than that. And it encompasses the fact that we are animals, we live in multi-species communities. We have always lived in multi-species communities and we evolved in those communities. 
So in thinking beyond the human, it's not just like when I went to Kenya and watched baboons and studied other primates in their natural habitat, which is clearly significant, but also thinking about the mutual sort of attention and impacts that all these species have one on another. Tim Ingold and Eduardo Cohn are two anthropologists who've been very influential in this type of writing. And I have here a quote from a book that if you don't know, I hope you'll jot down the title of How Forests Think by Eduardo Cohn, which is an amazing demonstration of this point of how there's a living world out there of which we are a part and we are not dominant to. A quote here from Cohn, the world beyond the human is not a meaningless one made meaningful by humans. And that's something that I try to think about every day as I write and as I speak. Next. So in becoming sort of facile with these ideas of beyond the human, we want to work with several concepts. Now, anthropomorphism, you know, is defined as attributing to other animals, other than human animals, human capacities or human emotions or human abilities. And this is a word that's always frequently thrown back at me in my work. If I'm talking about animal emotions or how complicated and sophisticated animal societies are, people will often say, oh, you're projecting from your species onto others. And this is an um, a concept that's going to kind of hover over the talk tonight that we want to really work with. And in doing so, it's important for me to make a distinction between human exceptionalism and human uniqueness. So we're all evolutionary theorists here, right? So we know that by definition, each species is unique. That includes us. It includes spiders and trout and warthogs and spider monkeys. By definition, we are unique. And what this means is that the argument that I'm, that I'm making is not trying to suggest that we are exactly like all other animals. We're not, we have our species specific capacities like all animals do. But what I am arguing against in this call for compassionate action is human exceptionalism. Human exceptionalism takes human uniqueness and goes way too far. It suggests that not only do we sometimes do things differently from other animals, but we do them better in a more elaborated and more intricate manner. So human exceptionalism suggests that human language is the most elaborated of all animal communication, that human societies are the most complicated and intricate of all societies found in the world, and so on. So when we are replying to charges of anthropomorphism, we don't want to move away from human uniqueness at all, but we do want to interrogate claims of human exceptionalism and look at them very, very carefully and not use them as assumptions. Next. Okay, these concepts have been very important in the work that I have been engaged in for about the last 10 years now, which focuses in large part on animal grief and also animal love. And you know, many scientists still come back with that A word, anthropomorphism, when I say that it is scientifically rigorous to suggest that a number of animals express love and express grief. But that indeed is my claim, not all animals to be sure, but some animals. So I'm interested in cases in which there's a family group or a partnership and one animal dies and there's a survivor left. And my definition for the expression of animal grief depends on knowing how a survivor is acting in this new moment compared to how he or she may have acted before. So I look for things like social withdrawal, a different way of eating or sleeping, something that's a, a altered behavioral pattern, and then species specific signals of distress in the body, the voice or vocalizations. And doing this work has brought me back again and again to issues that involve anthropomorphism and human exceptionalism and human uniqueness. Next. So let me give you an example. And this is one that I frequently use to talk about animal grief. It is in the Animals Best Friends book and it is in my TED talk. So if you're familiar with either of those, you'll have heard this. In the Salish Sea, which as you see here, is off of the Pacific coast of North America. 
uh, both the Pacific Northwest of the United States and British Columbia of Canada, there's a group of orcas or killer whales that are very well known and very well studied. They have been subject to a great deal of water pollution and noise pollution, a very busy shipping lanes through that area, and a reduction in their main food of Chinook salmon. So environmentally, they have been impacted in all kinds of anthropogenic ways, and they've been suffering a loss of vitality and a loss in their demographic profiles. So in July of 2018, when one particular orca named Talakwa gave birth, the scientists were very pleased and were hopeful that there would be a healthy calf added to this pod under such uh, significant stress. Unfortunately, what happened is that this calf died within an hour. And what happened over the next 17 days was a very interesting example of working with those concepts that we've been talking about. Tahlequah, as you can see in this slide, kept the body of her daughter on her own body and refused to let it slip into the ocean for 1,000 miles in 17 days. So if the body did slip off, she would retrieve it. And in my definition, this fits what I would consider to be grief. In other words, it goes beyond stress. There was uh, examples of social withdrawal and failure to eat and travel in normal patterns and an expression of what I take to be an enormous sense of connection with her daughter. We know that orcas and killer whales are large brain mammals who live in networks that are highly social, highly attuned to each other, and that there are real cultures of the ocean in which they trade information and learning. In other words, there is no scientifically viable point to make here about how this mother may not have realized that her daughter had died. I'm not arguing for a concept of death, but I'm arguing for awareness and attunement between these two. So this is an example that fits my definition of animal grief, and that is accepted by a large number, although not all scientists, as an example of grief. And I do want to make the point um, that while this is not a talk tonight about animal grief primarily, I could multiply these examples, not only with big brain mammals, but also with birds, uh, with giraffe, and a huge number of companion animals as well, that in one way or another, there's a suite of behaviors that fit an expression of grief. And that's very important to understand that I'm not talking about trying to read an animal's mind, but I'm working on visible cues that these animals present to us and using them in an operationalized scientific framework. Next. So for me, the reality of animal grief does not depend on animals possessing a concept of death. It's nonverbal, it's embodied, it's apart from a human standard and how we speak about this matters. So I'm going to give you one more example of animal grief to bring out some of these points that I think are important and that they will again, set the stage for what's coming next in this talk. Next slide. Back in 2017 or so, a really cool thing happened with an elementary school student in Prescott, Arizona. And yes, this does relate to my point. He, Dante Decourt, was given as a present a trail camera that he set up in the back of his home in the wash because he was very interested in looking at peccaries, also known as javelina, that are pig-like animals throughout North and South America or parts of North and South America. And what he found when he looked at all these images was that there had been a peccary who died and there was a very interesting response on the part of the other herd members. Next slide. If you look at the camera track records, in a third of them, the herd members were contacting the body directly. And in some cases, this was curiosity, nothing to do with grease, grief, nuzzling or smelling, staring at the body and so forth. But in other cases, my definition was met where the closest associates, two peccaries in particular, to this dead one, would act in ways that were very different than their normal pattern, would sleep up against the body, uh, protect the body, basically carrying on a sort of vigil, if you will, at the body and reacting to it in ways that seem consonant with something that is not stress, but is some kind of a response as a survivor to a dead close friend or associate. Next. Okay, here, here's the thing that I want to, to really emphasize about this example. 
when this work was published, and of course, although the senior authorship was given to this young boy, other adult behavioral ecologist scientists helped with the publication in a peer reviewed journal, the article used only response to death language and claimed we cannot determine if there is grieving. And interestingly, the lead author who was adult, who is a behavioral ecologist, and I discussed this and she has allowed me to quote her with permission. We wanted to say that we cannot with certainty say that the animals were grieving. We did not want to interpret the emotional aspect of this behavior. And we wanted instead to stick to the observable facts. However, I agree that their behavior meets a reasonable definition of grief for non-human animals. So why is this important? Well, here you have what I call the firewall of human exceptionalism. In other words, we have a tradition in scientific language that holds up human exceptionalism by refusing to use language that is based in animal emotion or deep animal cognition. Here, these scientists felt comfortable telling me as a colleague, yes, it's grief, but did not feel comfortable saying this in a peer reviewed journal. So this means that it becomes harder for many people in science and outside of science to see the real lived experience of animals because it's sterilized or wiped clean by the language that we use. And by extension, my argument is that it makes it harder to understand the complexity of these animals and therefore to really galvanize our understanding of how important our compassion is for them. So language is very important. And as an anthropologist, I think about this a lot. I would really challenge you in the next week or two weeks to read articles about animals or have conversations about animals and see how often the people you're reading or communicating with refer to them as it in a way that they never would for humans. Even if they're talking about fairly complicated animals, uh, there is a tendency in the media to revert to it. And our language says a lot about how we think about animals. Next. So what I'm trying to do that's so important for the book that we're about to talk about is to reframe anthropomorphism and to challenge human exceptionalism through the terms that I use and the evidence that I use to really ground um, the, the justification for using those terms. So in sum, grief and love don't belong to us. I think we know this from the way that animals express themselves, again, through really scores of examples across many animals. I have written up in numbers of books. And because therefore grief is not a human capacity, it cannot be anthropomorphism to use that term to apply to other animals. And this is a significant reframing of the way that this debate usually occurs. And it's something that is important. Next, please. So the second A that I'm finally getting to, and I'll talk about much, much more briefly, is an activist. Because I do believe that it's important to go beyond talking in scholarly terms to other anthropologists to talking to the wider public, as I have done uh, in Capitol Hill, as you see on the left, on the TED stage, as you see on the right. Next. And in various places in which people are concerned with the living experiences of animals. And I would like to make the point to anthropologists, uh, students of anthropology who may be here tonight, next, that this is becoming very, very common in anthropology, that they are aligned uh, attempts to engage the world, anthropology and activism together. And I said at the beginning that I do not consider myself an objective observer or objective scientist, and I want to make myself part of the narrative. And here I'm following many other anthropologists. I note for you particularly a book that came out earlier, well, I think it was actually late last year, called Light in Dark Times, by the anthropologist Elise Waterston and the artist Charlotte Corden. And they have made a beautiful graphic novel and one panel from it I represent here. They say, engaged anthropologists ask, what can my discipline offer the world in order to address a wide range of issues of profound public importance? And they write about trying to engage with violence against vulnerable human communities uh, violence against human immigrants and things that concern them deeply. And what I'm here to say is that I want how we treat other animals to be part of that conversation about profound public importance. Next. 
Lastly, I'm an author. And of course, the primary thing I try to do is to be accurate in my science writing as well as engaging. But it's important, particularly with the topics we're talking about tonight, to take an approach that is one of vulnerability and humility. And if you've read my Animal's Best Friends, you know that I do talk about things like um, failures of my own compassion or my cancer journey. I never in my life previously would have ever thought that I would project a slide of bald Barbara, but here, here I do. And it is part of that vulnerability and humility in storytelling. And you can see it came back. Next. Okay, so getting to the book that um, I wrote most recently, I wanted to center the concept of compassionate action, particularly because I think it is more effective than using the term empathy. In the scholarly literature, empathy can mean many different things. It can mean feeling with another individual because of a kind of contagion. For example, you notice someone laughing or yawning and you feel that urge to do the same thing. There's also a type of cognitive empathy where you think greatly about how another animal or, or other person is experiencing the world and you think with them in some ways about their journey. But many um, definitions of empathy don't include the other part that I really wanna get at, which is taking action to make a difference. Sometimes it's possible and often is written about in this way to have empathy as just a way of, again, having this mental connection or some sort of emotional feeling. And what I want to do is move us to a place where we feel with other organisms, but then we take that next step of taking compassionate action and turning harms into opportunities so that we look at these contexts of the environment all around us and, and try to see how we can make a difference. And in thinking about animals in the home and in the wild, I knew that, well, I'm very attuned to cats. I've cared for and rescued them my whole life practically. I have studied monkeys and also apes in a large number of contexts in the wild in Kenya, in captivity in various places. And so taking compassion and action for those types of animals comes more easily to me and I suspect to many other people as well, right? We're interested in how can we help the orcas? How can we help elephants and so forth? And what I wanted to do as a way to sort of broaden the discussion and my own experience was to challenge myself to have compassion for spiders, which is a species, an array of species that I've always had a reactivity towards. I was raised in a home where without second thought, we would squish spiders with um, tissues. So I'm going to read you from the start of chapter two. Those of you who've read the book again will recognize this, but not all of you will have. About 10 years ago, I walked into the bathroom at home one evening and saw on the floor at the baseboard near our sink cabinet, two enormous spiders. They simply sat there side by side. I felt that they were staring at me. An irrational feeling? Maybe, though astronomers and arachnologists later teamed up to announce that some spider's vision is so terrifically acute that they can see the moon. Whether they could make me out or not, my coming upon these two startled me so badly, their size, their stillness, their side-by-side -side doubling, that I fetched a shoe and beat the spiders to death. Then I flushed them down the toilet. This incident has stayed with me because I am ashamed of what I did. That was maybe 10 years ago, and it's something that I've never gotten over. And so I decided to see, using myself as a kind of experimental subject, what would it take to get me to move from my reactive fear to an appreciation of spiders? And I can tell you that it succeeded beyond my wildest dreams because I am now the person who is smitten with spiders. Next slide. I started out by going outside and looking at small jumping spiders, as you see here on the left. I joined a Facebook group for jumping spiders and they're very small and they're very cute and they're very non-threatening. So that was a good start for me. But you see on the right, an orb weaver from the genus Argiope that set up her web outside my study. And you can see that she's a sizable female. The male is much smaller who gets uh, for lunch and dinner quite significantly sized prey. And you see also the very specific form of the web there with that particular weaving, um, which is characteristic of this species. Next, 
So I realized that I wanted to protect spiders by uh, after having observed them. And we had one that produced an enormous web right across our entire porch. And we put up this very pithy and succinct sign, warning, don't bother spider for people who are delivering packages or visiting us. But how did this really come about? Next. Well, one thing I learned was doing a lot of reading about spider science. There's some fascinating experiments going on. And we know that we're talking here about wildlife, right? And that's what I wanna do is I want to open and expand and explode that category away from orcas and bison only to think about spiders as wildlife. So there's some scientists who in Costa Rica did experimental larder manipulations of orb weavers. So we know that orb weavers, just like the one I showed you, collect their prey on this big web and they keep them and they store them there and they call, and, and scientists call that the larder. So when scientists would remove some of those prey items and they would find out what sp spiders did, they learned that spiders searched the web in ways that were directly related to the quantity of prey that had been left on the web and then taken. In other words, if there were large numbers of prey items, the spiders would search and search more rigorously and for longer periods than if there was only one or two. And if you put plant debris experimentally on the, the, um, the web, they would not be um, persuaded at all that this was the same thing as having a prey item. They would not be distracted by that. So they had a, a preliminary, if you will, sense of numeracy, and they really used their web as a way to search and keep track of their prey. There was another group of scientists who did what was called a virtual reality experiment where they actually set spiders up in a little room with different objects and then chilled them in a freezer, put them on a treadmill and introduced them to a virtual reality world, which is just like when we put on those goggles and they would see the same objects that they had seen in three dimensions and they could map one environment onto the other and acted in really sophisticated ways. And I got to thinking about how cool all that is because it tells us that these spiders are thinking, but it also tells us that science tends to really privilege thinking about human standards, right? Do spiders count? Can they understand virtual reality? Can they do the things that we can do? And what is really important when it comes to thinking about wildlife in this context is to ask ourselves, how does a spider think? And what we've come to realize is that spiders really think with their webs. For example, they will manipulate certain parts of the web by moving them at very fast vibrations and frequencies, which trap um, different prey species more readily in certain areas. They change their webs according to the specific microhabitat where they're living and they learn what works well and what doesn't work well. And all of this can just open us up to understanding that when we see a spider, there is no reason to crush it with a tissue any more than we would wish to harm an orca or a bison. And the reason why this became particularly interesting to me is because of course spiders, unlike orcas and bison, blur that line between the home and the wild because they come into our homes, right? That's where I started with this anecdote of killing spiders. Next slide. So we know that when spiders come in the home, we can rescue them. We can take them outside in a cup, but we also can think about the fact that unlike other invertebrates that we may not wish to have in our homes like bees and earthworms, spiders can be perfectly wonderful companions who may prefer to live in our homes. I read uh, a book that made the argument that when we rescue them and take them outside, we may be taking them away from their preferred habitat, which may be our basement, the corner of our bedroom. And of course, I'm talking here about non-venomous spiders. So why not try to coexist with these animals in our homes and to think about our home territory as more than just a place for cats, dogs, and so forth, but also for wildlife that choose to come indoors, certain wildlife that choose to come indoors. We know that invertebrates really run the world, right? not just spiders, but also insects, like bees who are such important pollinators, earthworms who aerate the earth for us. And so that protecting insects, and I mean here to include also spiders, is protecting wildlife, not only in the sense that they are wildlife that I've been talking about, but in the sense that they are the bottom level, if you will, the base level for all of these trophic, uh, experiences that animals have in our ecosystems. 
So protecting nature in terms of going to national parks and state parks and local parks, as I alluded to earlier, is not enough. All of the wildlife that I've been talking about so far from the beginning photos through just now, we can protect not only in our own yards, our apartment balconies, also our campuses, our road verges, our community gardens, and they are all part of an ecosystem. And you know, I think that I've probably been very influenced by being an anthropologist because most of the anthropologists I know, when they think about ecosystems, they're thinking about the other large mammals among whom hominids, human ancestors developed and among whom we, we lived in human evolution. We were sometimes the hunters, we were sometimes the hunted, but there tends to be a great privilege in our discussions in anthropology on other mammals. And that is again, what I'm trying to, to think through and think with. So the invertebrates become a very, very important consideration in wildlife. And I've been talking about ecosystems, but I want to think about compassionate con conservation a little bit with you, because that is a, an approach that is beginning to question whether we are focused too much on ecosystems. Next slide. Now that might seem like an odd claim because we certainly know that it's important to think ecosystemically, right? We know that it does not make sense to try to go into some area and target only one species. Like if we want to, for example, um, save rabbits and we're going to be thinking about rabbits alone without thinking about their predators and all of the plants around them and all of the other things, it's not going to work. But compassionate conservation says something different. Of course, we must focus on ecosystems, but we can't make that the only focus to the exclusion of the, um, the well being of individuals. And that is the new spin, if you will, on conservation that this group of people is trying to bring. Now, we know that sometimes it's perfectly in line with compassionate action to just leave wildlife alone. I have a picture here from Yellowstone National Park of bison and a car in the middle of this bison herd. And having been there, I can certainly tell you that it's a fantastic experience to be in a vehicle and to be surrounded by bison, to watch them and to listen to them. But the problem is that many people, including in national parks, don't respect that boundary and get out of the car, get out of the bus or any vehicle that they may be in and rush towards the bison in a type of disnified understanding of what wildlife really is. So I have seen this frequently with my own eyes of people who have kids and are approaching bison as if the bison are perfectly harmless and not these huge mammals who can certainly, you know, intentionally or otherwise cause damage. And so by not taking selfies with wildlife, by not endangering other animals by our presence, by not you know, eating around them or trying to get too close to them, often we can make a significant difference. I think you are also aware as I am of how sometimes bears and other large mammals have to be euthanized because they've come too close to humans. And that is the fault of the humans who've been eating around them or coming close to them or taming them or something like this. But we also know, of course, that wildlife management is often very important in many ways. And what compassionate conservation is trying to say is that it has become an almost ingrained tradition in traditional conservative circles to think of lethal management as a perfectly acceptable conservation tool, which of course is really counterintuitive, right, if you think about it. So first, I just want to read you something about um, what this type of conservation is, is really about, because I think it is often um, caricatured or made to seem very simple, and it is not actually. There's no naive hope that each and every animal will be saved. That's naive in the extreme. Limited funds, time, and space render such a goal impossible. And scientists who approach matters from a stance of compassionate conservation know this. Tough choices must be made. How many bison can the Yellowstone ecosystem support? Do we save endangered frogs or birds first in a particular region? How many deer can suburban ecologies handle? What do we do when predators like wolves come into increasing conflict with humans? Decision makers will be better served when they are armed with data explaining how alternative management strategies will affect ecosystems and individuals both. And this really shouldn't be such a surprising 
turn, but it seems to be for some scientists. And I'm just going to give you two examples. And one involves what has unfortunately come to be called the cat bird wars. There was a book published several years ago called Cat Wars by Peter Mara and Chris Santella that made the claim that then emerged in nearly every headline as the media covered this, mm -hmm. that domestic cats, when they're outside, homeless or owned, kill between one and four billion birds every year in the United States alone. This statistic was married to a kind of trope of cats as murderers and became very popular as a support for lethal management of outdoor hunting cats. And I have taken significant objection to this type of narrative along with a group of colleagues led by William Lynn, who was an ecologist. And we have written in conservation biology about this and other places um, as well. And first of all, I'd like to make the point that one doesn't necessarily have to be either a cat person or a bird person. It's perfectly possible to be both. And think back, please, to all the pictures of the birds that I love in my yard and the cats that I love inside my house. But secondly, there's more to say. Next, please. That the statistics that were used between one and four billion birds is almost certainly flawed. There's a very um, rigorous study of how many birds there are in the United States. And this is of course seasonal and it's very hard to measure, but this group of scientists came up with a number of perhaps 3 billion. The 4 billion seems quite unlikely, but even more than that, this group of colleagues has argued that the statistics simply cannot be known. In other words, we don't have better statistics, but we do know that this is an inappropriate scaling up from some areas in which cat hunting is extreme, but we know that, for example, cats vary in their density per square mile, in their hunting ability, in how many birds and animals are around. We also know when it comes to the loss of bird life that is significant, unfortunately, in this country, that anthropogenic causes are very serious and perhaps primary. For example, the loss of wetlands, the erection of all these urban buildings that um, the birds fly into, and any number of other things that we could think of. So the point of compassionate conservation, there goes a cat, is that we need to be able to say it matters what happens to cats and it matters what happens to birds and small wildlife. And that the Cat Wars book calling for management of cats by any means necessary, including lethal management, is not compassionate conservation. Cats are obligate carnivores and we want to reduce the number of wild hunting cats. Everyone agrees on this, and this should be a matter of common ground, but it does not mean that it is okay to lethally manage cat populations. And so I think it's important to be able to say that we can find common ground. Next. And one way that I'm trying to do that is to promote responsible cat ownership. For example, when we had 14 cats, that we rescued from an outdoor colony, we kept them enclosed. What you can't see in this picture is that there are, there's fence uh, chain link all around and on the top. So these cats could not get out. The six cats in my home do not get out. It is important to reduce cat numbers and to acknowledge their impact, but it is important at the same time to suggest that innovative conservation measures can happen that are not lethal. And this is something that I really stand by. I did some work for um, NPR in, in writing as I was doing for them for six years, suggesting that the way that iguanas are dealt with in Florida uh, was absolutely lethal management and was um, not in any way compassionate action. Scientists had gotten the green light to bash iguanas that were considered invasive against research boats and research vehicles to stun them and kill them. And this is not, again, an example of compassionate conservation. So what we want to do is we want to understand that there are ways to reduce cat populations and cat impacts, whether it's through trap, neuter, and return, or, or how you treat your cats, where you keep them, that is a way for, that you can help bird populations and help cat populations at the same time. A very quick second example of compassionate conservation is just the suggestion that, and please do advance, that we can think of a multi-species perspective when we do any kind of management. William Lynn talks about the idea of salmon counts. 
when the fishing industry tries to determine what is a reasonable and sustainable catch for salmon, they ask how many human communities are eating salmon and set extraction numbers to human communities. Now, here is an example of, of what I talked about in the abstract for this talk of the anthropologist in me pulling in one direction and the animal activist pulling in another. I would suggest that for the sake of those orca that I talked about earlier, including Tahlequah, we should not be eating Chinook salmon with the exception perhaps of some indigenous communities in which this is a significantly traditional practice, but that most of us don't need to be eating Chinook salmon because the orca are dying without it. But in any case, um, the anthropologist in me recognizes that the multi-species perspective on management is important. In other words, what if you included as consumers of salmon in this um, sustainability equation, the orcas, the seals, the bears, and understand that when we are trying to manage the world, we're managing food sources right out of the lives of other animals. And that is another way in which compassionate conservation says we can think ecosystemically, but we can also think about animal individuals like Tahlequah. Next slide. I do want to, I have to keep my eye on the time and I do want to move beyond wildlife. We will come back to wildlife in the question and the answer. But I want to, um, to get a little bit into the question of captivity because I think that these questions are all deeply interconnected because very often how we treat animals in captivity also bears on how we treat them in the wild and vice versa. And my contention is that with certain significant exceptions, captivity is often harmful for animals. Now, of course, the animals that are here with me tonight are captive in my house. We know that sanctuaries that are very good at taking care of animals and honoring their life experiences occur in captivity. But the type of captivity that I'm talking about gets back to those examples I talked about the in the beginning. And let's talk about scientific laboratories. Because, next slide, when we are talking about animals in scientific laboratories, many times, although not always, we are talking about wildlife taken out of the wild and imported into scientific laboratories. So there is no disconnection here. Yes, there are certainly a lot of rodents that are bred in laboratories for use in science and so on. But in terms of primates, there are 75,000 monkeys in US laboratories alone. And many of them are taken or were originally taken for breeding from all across Asia and Africa. South America, other places where monkeys exist as wildlife. So these are most certainly interconnected topics. You know that the One Health approach suggests that in order to understand how to deal with the health of the environment, animals, plants, and humans, we must see that health is interconnected. And we must understand that when we try to heal ourselves, this has impacts on ecosystems and individuals from many species. And this is a very important perspective and the type of One Health perspective that my colleagues and I take is called Just One Health, where we also begin to apply principles of justice to how we treat other animals in One Health contexts. And that certainly includes animals in laboratories. So uh, next slide, please. My colleague, Hope Ferdowsian, who is a physician and a human and animal rights activist, wrote two years ago, currently animals are deliberately and commonly chosen for research as a result of their easy availability and manipulability, as well as institutional and cultural biases in society. Like human populations who were historically and systematically targeted, animals also have a frequently compromised capacity for free consent. And that's where we again get back to this just one health idea, that we are thinking of concepts like justice, consent, bodily freedom, bodily sovereignty, and applying them to how we take wildlife for our own purposes and in really incarcerate them in laboratories. So one of the most important points that I try to bring up about this is that Generally, people expect in college campuses, universities, and federal laboratories, there to be a robust ethical oversight system to make sure that animals are not harmed. And this exactly is untrue. Many committees exist, 
but they tend to be animal committees where there's a process of reviewing grants and ethics is not required to be considered. So we know from peer reviewed studies that if you take a bunch of proposals and you send them around to your colleagues at the same lab or the same university, they tend to be approved at a very high level. But if you do a blind study where you send out the same proposals to people who don't know the source of the origin of them, don't know the people who are writing them, that approval rate goes down markedly. So what I'm suggesting here is both as an anthropologist and an activist is that there is a culture of using animal models that has gone on for many decades and it is self-reinforcing. It's a culture that suggests that animal models are required for scientific advance of human health. And in fact, I am here to contest and to interrogate that claim. Next. Here is a chance again to think about animals sort of in ecosystems taken from the wild as rhesus macaques are from India or baboons maybe from Africa or uh, marmoset monkeys may be from South America and brought to laboratories, but also to have that compassionate conservation approach in terms of individuals. And in May of this year, I wrote an article for an online magazine that is called My Cancer Scars Map the Pain of Animals Held in Research Laboratories. And I wanted to put a primate face, if you will, on this issue of the 75,000 or possibly even more monkeys in laboratories by writing about Cornelius. Cornelius is a macaque money, monkey who was born at the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center in 2018. Eight days later was tattooed and was raised for some time with other monkeys, not with his mother. And then for many years of his life through the present, not every year, but many years has been held in solitary and used either for uh, medical protocols, invasive protocols, or for breeding. And thanks to undercover investigators, I had the chance to review still images, medical documents, and videos about Cornelius. And he is a fair representative of what happens to many of the hundreds and thousands of monkeys in this country. It was very, very clear from his posture and his affect and his behavior that these years of use in science and solitary living had really depressed him. Next, please. I wrote after looking at all of this material, this monkey is embodying through his posture and through his gaze, severe depression to the point of despair. That this animal has been allowed to continue in the state is indicative of extreme neglect of primate well-being. And here again, as an anthropologist and an activist, I want to think hard. An anthropologist would and should think about all stakeholders in this discussion. For example, scientists in the research community insist that these animals are necessary for advancing science and for biomedical breakthroughs and for drug breakthroughs. And I have talked to a number of these scientists. I have read a number of these scientists. And then I also want to speak back to these scientists as an activist. So here again is a situation where there's an overlap between the anthropologist and the activist. And there's also uh, sometimes a little bit of a pull in different directions. And here's what I mean. Next. Speaking of research is an animal research group and they tend to make the statement that animals are absolutely necessary for what I said before, medical breakthroughs and drug breakthroughs. And they tend to show very sanitized images of animals in their laboratories and to suggest we cannot proceed without them. However, through reading the peer reviewed literature, what I know is that up to 95%, between 93 and 95% of drug testing that uses animal models does not make it to helping humans. In other words, does not advance in trials to actually making a difference for humans. I know also that if you attempt to give, to induce Alzheimer's in rodents like mats, mice and rats, they do develop brain plaques, but do not develop in quite the same way the memory deficits that humans with Alzheimer's have. If you take a dog in a laboratory and you induce muscular dystrophy in them genetically, they do end up sick, but they are not faithful models of muscular dystrophy in humans. I know that if you challenge macaque monkeys like Cornelius with coronavirus, that they do get sick, but they very often do not show the same symptoms as humans. 
And therefore, what it turns out to be is that non-animal models are actually more effective. Next slide. So in terms of compassionate action, what we can do is to learn about these non-animal models and to understand a future of science that is actually better than the culturally entrenched model we have now that not only harms other animals, but harms human health as well. And that brings us right back to One Health and just One Health. You may have heard of Organs on a Chip, which is just of one of many technology that I could talk about. Organs on a chip are these little devices that are about the size of a thumb drive. They have microfluidic channels in them, as you see here in this picture. And what happens is that scientists can grow, say, kidney cells from humans or gastric cells or lung cells and subject those human cells to drug tests and environmental manipulation in ways that bypass other animals and obviously have a more faithful rendering using um, non-animal models. So I am not suggesting that animals have never helped human health, but what I'm suggesting is that overwhelmingly the picture is different than the biomedical community would have us believe, and that the time has come to use our compassionate brains to understand that modern technologies are actually better. And that's the activist talking, but it's also the anthropologist talking, because remember that I think of the continuation of animal models as a cultural issue in universities and federal labs. Next, and very quickly as we start to wrap up here, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that compassionate action for animals in our food and food justice systems is extremely important. Um, I'm going to just read two very quick um, excerpts because we know it, it, it's really without question and the world is really waking up to, to two aspects of this behavior that um, animal, when we eat animals, animals of course suffer. It's not only a matter of killing them, but killing them at say six months, a pig that can live for 15 years is killed at six months, a cow that can live for you know eight, 10 years is killed at, at a year, that kind of thing. But meat and dairy production, I'm reading here from chapter five, eats up 83% of the world's farmland and produces a whopping 56% of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions while providing only 37% of protein and 18% of calories. So we know the climate meeting is going on in Glasgow, right? Last week and this week. We know that we want to put a cap on harmful greenhouse gas emissions. And one amazing way to do that is to remember that our agricultural system is a significant emitter of gas and to really talk about this in a Just One Health framework. I also want to, to tell you that while I have been working on animals as uh, thought to be food animals, I read a book by Alex Blanchett, who was an anthropologist who wrote something called Porcopolis. And I learned that we have to think beyond only animals in our food system, which is many people don't think much about as it is, but we need to go even further. And I have here, don't forget the corporate pig, because what I learned from reading Blanchett's work is important for what we're talking about tonight. Not until I read this book did I fully grasp just how ubiquitous in American life is the corporate pig. I knew that pig parts, you know, beyond the ones we eat, are turned not only into pork chop, bacon, and sausage, but gelatin used in marshmallows, gummies, and jello. But Blanchette's list of pig-derived gelatin products goes further. So here we understand what happens to the part of the pig that is not used for food. Photographic prints makeup and other cosmetics, gel-based medical pills, sandpaper, waterproofed fabrics, some wines, simulated mammal tissues for ammunition testing, material for culturing cells in laboratories, paper money, and possibly the pages of our books. Radically disassembled pigs are found not only in the food consumed by millions of dogs and cats, but also in asphalt on American highways. And so what I'm suggesting here is that there's often a kind of knee-jerk reaction when we hear that people, for example, in certain Asian countries may eat dogs, and there's a, a, an attempt to disassociate us from such practices. But what we do in the West is very similar. It may not be dogs, it may be pigs, it may be cows, but they're all sentient mammals who think and who feel. Next, please. So in conclusion, 
Who do we like to be smart and who do we like to be stupid? People are fascinated with emotion and cognition studies of orcas, elephants, chimpanzees, dogs, and cats. But we aren't so comfortable with learning that, for example, spiders are smart, cows are smart, pigs are smart, and I could go on with any number of other species. There was a study done that I often talk about that had American participants uh, divided into two groups. One group was told that there was a type of mammal that lived in New Guinea, period. The other group was told that this type of mammal lived in New Guinea and was eaten in New Guinea. And that second group of people who knew that this hypothetical species was a food animal automatically related, relegated that food animal to being less intelligent and less deserving of moral concern. We don't want our food animals to be smart, but they are. They, they are smart. They think and they feel. And so in wrapping up the food just topic, I would just have us think about that and ask how we really are conjuring up in our mind images of different animals, the language that we use to talk about them, who is an it and who's a, a who, who do we want to know about uh, being smart and who do we not, and so on. Next slide. So as an anthropologist thinking about these food systems, I often hear it's time for the world to go vegan. And then the activist says, okay, I get that. The anthropologist says, we're forgetting. We're forgetting millions of people around the world who fish from the sea, who raise animals on small farms, who may in fact absolutely need to depend on subsistence hunting to feed their families. So again, Yes, it's urgent for the climate and for the health of ourselves and other animals to reduce the consumption of meat and dairy and seafood, but we all in this world cannot do this at the same rate and with the same urgency. And if we're going to be thinking about food justice, we have to remember that. We have to remember that the global inequalities across this world mean we are all not in the same position with the same ability and the same privilege to be able to work on this problem in exactly the same way. Next. So regarding compassion and compassionate action, I've gone through these contexts. I've asked us to think about how we may play a role. And the last thing I want to say to you is, if you hear, be an activist for animals because they're voiceless. Remember some of the things that I've said, because I've been talking about animals, whether they're domestic or wild, who aren't voiceless. They are telling us with their bodies when they love and when they grieve. They are telling us with their postures in laboratories when they're depressed and when they want out. They are telling us when they are in slaughterhouses that they do not want to die for a meal at age six months and on and on. These animals are telling us through their behavior what we need to be able to see and to think about in order to up our compassionate footprint. And I am not where I want to be yet with my compassion, but I'm, I'm working on it. Next slide. So I want to thank you all for listening to me. Um, at this point, I need to stop and I need to move to the question and answer. And I want to thank very much once more, Dr. Volsh for making this possible. And I'm very interested to hear what comments and what questions you have. And we can certainly stop sharing the screen at this point. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, and I know that it can be very difficult to get through all the things that you wanna say in a short period of time. So I appreciate um, your efforts and your work on that. I am gonna go ahead and pin us together um, okay. so that we come up together on the recording. And um, there are some questions that have come in. And so I'll just go ahead and start by, by bringing those into the conversation. Um, one came up, do you think that grief in species that experience it is adaptive? And if so, what advantages might it confer? Good question. I've thought about the adaptability or the adaptive nature of grief a lot. And there is a theory that I talk about in How Animals Grieve, which is my 2013 book, that suggests it's basically a period of brain rest, if you will, that especially when there's social withdrawal and altered patterns of behavior, it's a chance for an animal to kind of regroup and to be away and to kind of uh, regain health and, and perspective, if you will. And I know that that sounds a little bit like I'm speaking in human terms, 
But we know that, for example, from a study at baboons in Kenya, there was a mother who experienced a loss of her daughter through a predator attack. And she, for about six weeks, went through that social withdrawal and did not groom as baboons usually do, did not participate in matrilineal networks as these baboons usually do, and stayed by herself and then regained um, interest in doing these things. So it may have been that she simply needed time. And also grief may be adaptive in terms of uh, allowing an animal to sort of refresh looking for a mate in other words, if you lose your mate or you use, lose an offspring, if there is an evolutionary push for reproductive success and for continuing along with mating and family systems, this can be a period where um, sort of having that emotion of, of missing an individual may be a sort of push to then continue to look for a mate and continue to resume um, breeding, which is of course what evolution is, is really focused on, right? That is not survival, but it's reproduction. Right. Um, we did have a few people commenting when you're talking about the spiders and their appreciation for spiders as well. Oh, excellent. Um, and just a, a second comment did come up. We are recording this, so I will make sure that a recording is available um, through the department YouTube channel and through Canvas for those of you who need it for class. Um, another question, given that you are immersed in issues of animal welfare and its opposite, what strategies or techniques help you remain emotionally resilient and deal with grief, anger, and frustration? Well, thank you for acknowledging that because I feel all of those, grief, anger, and frustration. And some days are easier than others. And one thing that I try to do is to read a lot of books and articles by people who are working to make the world a better place. You know, there was just a book that I reviewed for NPR last month called The Book of Hope by Jane Goodall. And we all know that Jane Goodall is the leading chimpanzee behaviorist in the world, but has also become an activist for animals. And she wrote a whole book dedicated to why we can still have hope. And one of the things she really emphasized, and I do recommend the book to you, is that younger people are so politically activated and activated and so motivated to make a difference. She feels a lot of hope in people your age, college students, uh, high school students, and elementary students. Now, I would add that in one way that's a bit unfortunate because the world that we've left you is the reason why you have to be so politically motivated and so active. But um, we are all grateful for that. And another thing I, I try to do is just sometimes take days where I read just a lot of positive things and share positive videos about animal rescues. I learn about things that have worked in terms of conservation initiatives when there's rewilding of an animal or an ecosystem. And another thing is just to acknowledge that it's okay to be frustrated and angry and talk about it with people. That uh, one thing I've learned from working with therapists is that the worst thing one can do with any kind of a trauma response is to hold it in. And so talking with other people who understand is very, very important. So what I'm basically saying, the, the whole thing is find your people, stay with them, read about what they're doing, talk to them, be open about them. And don't be ashamed of saying that it's really hard on some days. Yeah, yeah. always good advice. Um, do you think humans should go vegan to save the ecosystems? Okay, I'm going to talk about this one for a while. Um, I am not <laughs> vegan. People assume I'm vegan and I'm not. I am a reducitarian. I'm pretty close to vegan. I'm really close to vegan, as a matter of fact, but I'm not totally vegan. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And I think that my reasons, again, may bear on the larger question. So not everyone can eat totally vegan. Some people, uh, for various reasons of disability, health issues uh, don't thrive on being 100% vegan. And I'm one of those people. And so my long history with um, cancer treatment and other things has made it impossible for me really to feel well eating completely vegan. But for other reasons too, I don't think that it is reasonable to expect the world to go vegan. And I did talk about this a little bit in suggesting that that, that comment seems to indicate that well, everyone has plant-based alternatives available to them or alternative proteins available to them. And having lived in Africa for two and a half years and traveled in many parts of the world, I see that that's simply not true. And so my argument is not that veganism is about um, white privilege because it's not. I mean, there's amazing black activists and black vegans who are in some ways leading us um, around the world in many places with uh, 
countries of color and communities of color, but rather that we all have different starting points and different abilities. Therefore, what I do think is that each person in each family, according to what is possible, would be great if we really made an effort to move plant-based to the degree that we can, and that those of us who can do more than others should be thinking about how to spread that around the world. For example, if you are dealing with families who may not want to be dairy farming families anymore, what alternatives can the government offer? For example, you know, there's hemp farming. This is very important and some animal activists I know are working with dairy farmers on this. There's all kinds of things we can do, but we shouldn't just put the onus on the individual when this is a systemic issue of food justice that is really tied into global inequality. Yeah. Um, so I, I see a couple different questions thinking about the research animal route. Um, so, is there an ethical route for lab testing that does not involve animal testing? Like where are we really with some of those technologies in order to really improve, um, mm -hmm. you know, the outcomes for animals or reduce, I, I know that the three R's, right? Um, reduce, refine, and replace. Re replace, yeah. The group of people I'm working with wanna go well beyond the three R's. It's not just reduce, refine, and replace, but really come up with a new system. And the reason is again, because while it may be tempting to focus on that moment of invasion when say, for example, you knock down an animal and you do some invasive procedure and you decide that you, know, you can do that less often or you can do that in a bigger, prettier cage or you can do that with fewer animals, the entire system of captivity is completely changing these animals' lives. It's forced breeding, it's forced solitary confinement and all of that stuff. So yeah, we know that things that work well, including organs on the chip may also be, for example, phase uh, zero toxicity studies where drugs are tested on humans in an unusual and fresh way with very small amounts that make sure that we're not exposing humans to you know, difficult toxic substances, but they're called phase zero trials. There are just, there's, there's all kinds of technologies, including 3D imaging, um, neuro mapping that are getting us to places where we see that using human testing to advance human health just makes better sense. Now, I will say that we're not there yet. It's not like we can say, okay, these technologies are in place and we can stop animal testing at this moment, but why are we not there yet? It goes back to the culture where animal model proposals are completely considered the norm. They're completely replicated, they're approved. And what we need is for places like NIH, National Institutes of Health, other federal granting agencies to really up their budget commitment to what are called alternative methods. When that happens, we get exciting technologies that result, but the bulk of the money and the bulk of the culture is still focused on animal models. But I will tell you that in, um, in the Netherlands, in, in Israel, places in Harvard, there are animal, there are alternative to animal centers that are working on this. And there's all kinds of papers coming out that are highly, highly promising. We just need bigger budgets. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on the role compassion has in ethical action given A, the diversity of ethical frameworks that exist and B, the diverse constraints or capacities of global people willing to ethically engage? Yes, well, it was very unusual for me to take up so many contexts at one time in this last book that I wrote. And I'm not suggesting that every person, whether he, she, or they define as an activist or not, needs to take up every context. I think what's important is that we start educating younger people, and by this I mean elementary school and high school people, about some of these contexts and what we can do. You know, the idea that Jane Goodall falls back on through her Roots and Shoots organization and other youth organizations is that again, people can't understand what the harms are unless they're taught about them and made to understand that individuals make a difference. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that we go into elementary schools with these horrible stories of lab animals and slaughterhouses. But what I am suggesting 
is that taking um, and from examples of for what happens in Norway, for example, forest schools where kindergartners learn outside and they learn about nature and the beauty of nature and how to conserve nature right from the beginning. Or for example, that we teach kids in school that you don't have to dissect animals in labs anymore because we have good synthetic alternatives and really let them know that if they feel sad or feel upset when animals are harmed, there's something to do about it and they can speak up about it. So I'm hoping that the idea of multiple contexts is inviting rather than daunting. And you just find your place. Like I said before, you find your people. If you're interested in conserving wildlife, there's just so much you can do if you're interested in working in labs and so forth. In terms of the second part of the question, it has to do with, I think, the enthusiasm and the ability of people globally to devote themselves to this. And this is a real issue. Certainly, we cannot expect people who are living in forced poverty, who are trying to work endless hours every day to feed their family, to have time and energy to do these things. But what this does mean is it compels those of us who have any amount of privilege to work hard on these issues. And I also think it's no longer the case, and you all know this, that we're just going to help other animals because we feel compassion for other beings. We see through One Health and just One Health that if we don't solve the climate crisis, everything else is secondary in that in 50 years, we're not going to have a recognizable world. And one way to solve the climate crisis is every day when we eat to do the best we can to eat in ways that minimize greenhouse gas emissions. And again, this will vary, but people all around the world with all budgets and all abilities can make contributions to this. And I'm also very, very much learning from people who are small farmers, who are feeding their families through small farming and not in any way vilifying them. We must realize that this is not the same as factory farming. It, it is still a slaughter for the animal and it's still a concern for animal activism. But we know that there are many alternative ways of being able to farm with some degree of kindness. So we can't just lump, like we don't want to lump all hunters together, right? And, and like put you know these, these trophy hunters together with people who are seriously subsistence hunting for their families, the same thing with farmers. And so we wanna to begin to make distinctions and work together with people globally as best we can. That's actually a great transition to Colin's question. So do you think a sustainable method of meat consumption and production is even possible? Say from local small scale grass fed locales while maintaining a humane way of raising these animals? Um, and would this apply to reducitarian diet, consuming overall less meat, et cetera? So do you think there's a way to do that in a humane or more humane or less not humane way? Well, I'm glad you said humane or more humane because I will come right out and say that I don't think there's such a thing as humane slaughter. And I say this because we have to understand that it's not like most animals just you know, live a good life and then they have one bad day. We certainly know on factory farms and CAFOs, these con concentrated feeding operations, that you know, they're fattened up, they're fed with antibiotics, they're, they're crowded in, they're dense, they're miserable, they're filthy. Okay, so the question is not about that, but about more sustainable ways of raising animals. And it is possible for animals to suffer less on other farms, but let's take dairy farms. We know that even on relatively small or moderately large dairy farms, repeatedly, uh, the females have their offspring taken away from them because the goal is for the females to produce milk for humans, right? So if we go back to a grief framework and we think compassionately about sentient mother cows, we know that even when they're not being slaughtered, they do suffer. They bellow, they search for their offspring, they constantly are concerned about what's happening to their families. So I would question the whole notion of humane farms unless they're very small and very unusual. And I did allude to that a few minutes ago that some farmers are doing these things. In terms of sustainable meat production, this is an issue that I'm still thinking about and still working on. Um, you know, the act activist in me constantly thinks when we talk about sustainable meat production, we're talking about animal suffering and we're talking about animal death. And it's hard for me to separate them. But of course, moving in the right direction away from factory farming is a good, it is a good thing. 
it is better. It's just not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient in my view. I don't think that this was an adequate answer to sustainable meat production questions, but I think we're very much still in the middle of this. I mean, we know uh, the, the incredible harm that beef production causes, right? In terms of the amount of water that's required and the amount of calories that are extracted. I don't know that there's such a thing as sustainable high level beef production. Then you suggest, well, maybe there's more sustainable production with chickens. And we talk about the billions of chickens that then have to suffer. So it's, it's a very complex question that I, I think is, is actually more complicated than I can answer adequately here. Okay, let's go to the other side of the relationship then. Um, Ali asks, as scientists, how can we ask questions that address and keep in mind the diverse ways that other species experience the world? Oh, yeah, that's something I love thinking about. And I think here, the onus is really on us to move away from constantly assessing animals using a human standard. You know, if you read the psychology literature, the anthropology literature even, a lot of the testing that goes on of animals, and I refer here not to drug testing, but to behavioral testing in non-invasive laboratories. And I did this too in earlier in my career. Absolutely, I'm not exempt. You know, can they use tools? Can they solve problems? Can they, can they think with, uh, with numbers? Can they solve problems like we can? Okay, interesting, but does that not mean that our compassion is only going to be directed at animals that are like us? And I started out very much like that. In graduate school, I was told in no uncertain terms by my professors and my dissertation committee that other primates, particularly monkeys and apes, are the most like us, they're the most sophisticated, and therefore that's why we have to study them. Not only because they're evolutionary models, but because they're like us. And I no longer believe that because I think that when you get into really looking at, say, how do pigs think? How do spiders think? We're limited, yes, but there are things that we can do. And understanding that we can ask questions, at the very least, pose questions about how these animals are thinking will get us out of that human standard. Even if we have trouble coming up with the answers, the very process of posing the questions is important. And I'm going to take just a minute and talk about octopus here. I can hardly believe that I didn't talk about octopus in the talk, but again, I had limited time. So octopus, as you know, are invertebrates. They are the only invertebrates that are included in the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness. They do think, they do solve problems with tool use, but they do things we don't understand. They have neurons in their arms as well as in their central brain, and they feel the world and touch the world and think through their arms. And we need to think about what that means. And it's hard for us to do that because that's not how we experience the world. Yeah. Um, one last question, and I, I know this one might be a bit of a doozy, but it's something I've seen come up quite a bit in, on Twitter in various different spaces. Um, so how, for those of us who do study in this space, right, multi-species research, um, our relationships with other species, whether in the wild or our homes, how do we address the fact that we are viewed or are potentially prioritizing non-human lives when there are so many human em emphasized issues to be addressed. And I've seen this come up periodically where it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a place of privilege to even worry about other species instead of worrying about human strife. So how do you, how do you answer that when that type of a, a issue or yeah. question arises? Well, you know, I just can't think in a binary, right? I can't think that it's either or. Um, yeah, of course, we have limited energy. We have limited money. These things are obvious. But I also believe so much in the One Health and Just One Health view of interconnectedness that if I work on issues, let's say, of lab laboratory animals, and this really is a major, major focus now, I feel that I am working for humans as well. I'm not just working for the 75,000 animals, but I think that the science that is coming in the future is going to help people, not only in my own country, but people globally. If you think about, for example, the number of people who globally suffer from malnutrition and um, malaria and of course COVID-19 and other viruses and there will be emerging viruses still coming. We have to get the science right and we're not getting it right with animal models. So, you know, I go out and I talk about Cornelius the monkey, but behind Cornelius the monkey, 
really genuinely, I believe, are sick people. And the same thing happens when I talk about food and food justice systems. So I think that when you walk out into your yard and you help a spider in a web, you might not think automatically of how you're helping humans, but when you're helping an ecosystem, whether it's through an ecosystem level or an individual level of intervention, you are helping the world and people are part of the world. So we need people doing all of it. I love that answer. Um, probably because I, we've been using the One Health model in class quite a bit. It's one of the reasons that, I, that we brought in your book to, to read in that class, because I wanted students to be able to see the interconnectedness of everything, so. Yeah, and I just so wanted much. to say in, in conclusion, for those of you who hung in there to the end, thank you. I have told you how to find me on Twitter, and uh, that's BJ King Ape, but it's also possible to find me through my website if you have a question and would like to email me. Uh, and that's the reason why I'm telling you about my website barbarajking.com. There's a contact tab and I do answer. I may be not immediately fast, but I do answer. So thank you all and um, good luck with your studies and I appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you.